Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's discussion as we explore ways to build a resilient regulatory framework for small and mid-sized banks. This is Nicolina from Connect Global Group, and I'm very pleased to have you all with us today. This webinar is brought to you in partnership with Finastra, and before we get started, I would like to go over some basic instructions so that you can all make the most out of this session. On your main screen, there are multiple application widgets you could use. All widgets are resizable and movable, so you can move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrow in the top right corner. We would of course love to hear from you, so please submit your comments and questions at any point during this webinar and we'll try to answer as many of these as possible in the next 60 minutes. If we don't manage to address all of your questions, We'll make sure to follow up with you in a separate email after the event is over. Now, for the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs or sessions that are running in the background. Finally, a reminder that a copy of today's session will be available in the next couple of hours, so please look out for that email. So let's get started. I will now hand you over to our moderator. Over to you, Sean. Thank you, Nicolina. So we're at an interesting point in the economic cycle for this panel discussion. So we're seeing levels of inflation that we haven't seen since mm -hmm. the early 90s, caused by a lot of hangovers from the pandemic. So supply chain issues that we saw during lockdown have been uh, have continued. We've seen an uptick in demand for commodities as we've come out of the pandemic. And there's been a lot of uh, consequences of the government largesse during the pandemic. And all this is uh, exasperated by the war in Ukraine. And after years of low interest rates, this high inflationary uh, pressures have led to the central banks taking action and sent, uh, interest rates have risen more steeply and quickly than anyone had anticipated. So the e EBA in Europe had anticipated this through a set of special stress tests in 2017 uh, on interest rate risk in the banking book, and that was brought in and made part of the Pillar 2 reporting uh, under, uh, under Basel. Um, there's also been secondary effects of the interest rate uh, rises. So customers seeking to protect purchasing power and uh, chasing yield began switching the primary deposit accounts. And in the US, the, actually the amount that's held in deposit fell for the first time in decades. So this environment, the uh, high inflation combined with the rising interest rates has led to some notable banking failures, in particular Silicon Valley Bank where 40 billion was withdrawn in just 24 hours, uh, failed, leading to contagion with Signature Bank and a rescue of First Republic Bank in the US. And globally, uh, in Europe, we've seen the collapse of Credit Suisse, which was considered a globally systemic important uh, bank. So this predictably has led to the response from regulators, which is really the focus of this discussion. So in the UK, the governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, questioned whether banks were holding enough liquidity, seen especially in the light of digital banking where money is more fluid. And in the US, where the relaxation of banking regulations under the Trump administration was in part blamed for the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, President Joe Biden called for independent mm -hmm. regulatory agencies to impose tighter rules on the financial system. So to discuss some of these issues, we have a panel of three senior bankers today, Vanessa Scolding, Beata Lubinska, and Frank Sanson. So Vanessa is head of treasury operations at Aldemore Bank, and Aldemore Bank were part of the first wave of challenger banks with the UK, and they were acquired by the first RAND group in 2019. So if you could introduce yourself, Vanessa. Thank you, Nicolina. Good 
Hi, yes. Um, I'm Vanessa. I have worked at Aldermore Bank uh, since January 21, uh, joining remotely during COVID. Prior to that, I was at Investec, headed up the core operations there. Uh, and Beata is part of Alika Bank. And Lisa Bank were founded in 2020 during the pandemic. And in 2022, it was a big year for the bank where they achieved full profitability. And they purchased a half a billion SME lending portfolio from Allied Irish Bank. If you could introduce yourself, Beata. Thank you very much, Shen. Um, Beata Lubinska, I'm a treasurer of Alika Bank uh, since three years already, uh, leading treasury department. Uh, previously, I worked in uh, both in Milan, in London, in Standard Charter, Deloitte, and many other institutions. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me today. And finally, we have Frank Sanson, who's treasurer for China Construction Bank in New York. And China Construction Bank have 4.7 trillion in assets, making them the second largest bank globally. If you could introduce yourself, please, Frank. Okay, thank you. Um, Frank, as you mentioned, uh, I'm currently the treasurer of uh, CCB, the New York branch. I've been there, I've been here for over eight years from 2015. Prior to that, I was with Dexia. So a lot of my European um, European um, participants in this call will recollect that Dexia was a very large European bank. Uh, we um, I navigated the, the treasurer navigating the U.S. dollar liquidity crisis, uh, navigated the bank through that liquidity crisis. Um, and if, before that, I was the treasurer of National Bank of Kuwait, happened to be the treasurer when which the uh, most um, unusual or uh, situation where the bank actually less lost our headquarters when um, Kuwait, National Bank of Kuwait and Kuwait was invaded by Iraq. So I'm happy to be here and, and thank you very much for the invitation. We'll start with a set of questions. Um, firstly, can you discuss how regulations may differ for big and small banks considering recent banking failures, exemption to regulations and potential differences in capital charge requirements or reporting obligations between larger and smaller banks? So if you could lead with that question, Beata, please. Yeah, regulation introduced the proportionality approach for banks. Uh, what does it mean? It means that bigger and complex institutions needs to implement more sophisticated analysis to determine the underlying risk and quantification of capital to cover these risks. In fact, we have the standardized uh, approach and internal based approach. And the standardized approach, as we know, it is much simpler to calculate the risk and capital which is allocated against these risks. However, it does not necessary, this is what I would like to um, highlight, it does not mean necessary uh, that the actual level of risk which the bank is running is calculated correctly on the standardized approach because this is exactly the main point. It is simpler. The framework is less cal cal calculation framework is less complex, but it's also uh, it is also as, as the name indicates standardized. So the method if, uh, is prescriptive, and quite often mm -hmm. it's not calibrated to the riskiness of the bank itself. Uh, meanwhile, the, um, the bigger institution has a possibility to build their own computational method, which quite often reflect exact level and characteristic of the balance sheet of this bank. So it's definitely um, worth to highlight the difference between those two for smaller banks and bigger banks, because they're different. Thank you. Uh, could you continue on that, Frank, please? Sure, you know, um, thank you for that. That was great. I, I, maybe it's uh, important if we uh, start with the rationale for uh, the overall purpose of the regulations is certainly for better risk, known better risk management, and two, for systemic stability. Uh, and maybe we should think about why have regulators decided to tailor it. And, and part of that is for simplicity and transparency and for the cost of compliance. So what are the strengths? Well, the strengths from this new regulatory uh, based on asset size or regulatory uh, criteria based on asset size is one is the cost savings for some of the smaller banks. Uh, but, um, 
um, and also while at the same time trying to measure their risk relative to the systemic risk to the banking system. So I think that that there's some strengths, but there's obviously some weaknesses, and some of the weaknesses are the cliff effect, and some of the weaknesses are when the smaller banks don't have the proper um, in, um, prudential risks in place or, or safeguards in place. I think it's important, though, if we look at for a second, uh, and for example, in the U.S., we have a number of categories. Uh, and particularly, uh, I think the most important category is under 50 billion and over 50 billion. And so in the U.S., if you're over 50 billion, you have what's called enhanced prudential standards. Uh, and that enhanced prudential standards, as you mentioned earlier, has stress tests, capital planning, liquidity requirements, uh, uh, counterparty limits, risk management, a whole broad array of, of um, regulations that are for the safety and soundness of the bank. I, I think one of the things that you mentioned earlier was what, what administration is better at this? And I find that uh, this whole discussion is it shouldn't be so political. And I find that some of the one of the disappointing aspects I've seen in our recently is that everything seems to become political. So, for example, you mentioned as uh, the Trump administration and Biden is saying he's going to make it stronger. Um, I think that unfortunately it shouldn't be political. I think that the Standard Valley Bank, the Silicon Valley Bank, this was an e egregious risk management failure as the, on the asset and liability side. Uh, they, um, as just a little bit of a history, they had almost 200 billion in, in um, deposits and, and assets. Uh, it, was a, it was clearly a failure of their asset and liability management, failing to even some of the enhanced prudential standards they had uh, in place and, and they they were running stress tests, um, annual stress tests. Um, so I think that we need to just be very careful about how we describe the current situation. I think it's great. Uh, well, I shouldn't say it's great. I think one of the benefits of Silicon Valley Bank, it's a wake up call for banks of all sizes, whether they're two billion, three billion, five hundred million, or fifty billion. We have we have learned very quickly about the impacts of poor risk management. And you brought up a really good point in the beginning, and I don't think we've, we're giving it enough um, consideration. We are in an environment where the Federal Reserve has raised rates is historically higher than they, and faster than they ever had. And after 10 years of very low rates, this has created a situation where many banks, number one, are prepared to manage the risk. Number two, probably you're not familiar with this type of risk, but I think you bring up a very important point, and that is for all banks of all sizes, they have to recognize and realize that interest rate risk is as important as liquidity risk, and these risks cannot be managed in a silo. And what I mean by that is these risks needs to be managed. You have to watch your liquidity risk, but you have to watch the potential impact to your overall balance sheet from your interest rate risk. Um, so... Specifically answering the question, um, there has to be, I do think that that there has to be, um, just for sakes of sake, for sake of cost, there has to be some sort of regulatory, um, I say, differences for the bigger banks, which create the biggest systemic risks. I hope I didn't go into too much uh, um, detail on that response to that question. Thank you, Frank. And if you could continue on the next question, which is, given the current regulatory environment, what should banks be doing to ensure the future success of their operations and growth? Well, I, I, I think that's a great second question. I, I, I think it really points to the failures of Silicon Valley Bank. And when I, I hate to say the failures of Silicon Valley Bank, but um, a bank, no matter how big or small, is a manager of the assets and liabilities. So um, I think that the banks, given the current regulatory environment, I think it's important that each bank looks at the current regulatory environment, but looks at, through the current regulatory environment to ensure that they have the proper proper systems and reporting in place. Uh, I, I, for example, Silicon Valley Bank, um, they had the they had the proper they if they followed their regulatory guidance, we would not be in this particular. But they would not be in a particular situation. Perhaps the whole banking system wouldn't be in this particular system. So I think that 
uh, what banks should be doing to ensure the future success of their operations is they have to be able to properly manage their risk and they need to understand in a, derp, in, a in a deeper understanding of what the implications of of managing interest rate risk and what the deeper implications of managing liquidity risk and how they how they interact and should not be just simply managed um, in a silo effect. Um, so basically just reviewing, doing a deep, deep drill and a deep dive down and, and continue to, to run stress tests. One thing I might add from the stress test from the interest rate risk uh, stress uh, tests and capital planning, What's important to note is 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 the is is the regular regular regulatory agencies recommended we use the Fed forecast for interest rates. Now, if, to just take a quick moment to say the Fed forecast for interest rates for those that are not familiar or those that have followed it, in the course of the year they have recalibrated their interest rates um, literally four or five times, raising it each for the final um, what they call peak terminal rate by 100 basis points each time. So at the beginning of the year, when they released their Fed forecast, their Fed forecasts were perhaps for a 2% peak in terminal interest rate. Unfortunately, if you were to use what the Fed forecast in your interest rate stress scenarios, you would not have properly forecasted the risk that was evident or actually forecast or actually became a reality. So I know it, 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 at CCB New York, we stress test up and down 300 basis points. And so I think smaller banks should also not necessarily listen just simply what the regulators have you stress, but they should think a little bit outside the box and have a little bit more um, risk, um, I would say more more. Trying to understand the tail risks and I trying to understand the extremes when they do their their um, stress test. And if they had done that properly, perhaps we would not be having this conversation today. Thank you, Frank. And I'm going to turn to you now, Vanessa. Well, Maybe if you could focus a little bit more on the operational side of things. Yeah, so as I um, echo in a lot, really, from what, what Frank was saying and, and leading on from that, I think it... <laughs> It's imperative that organisations, smaller banks, focus on embedding a culture that identifies, manages and controls the inherent risks within the business. And, and like Frank said, looking across the across the silos, I think uh, often ensuring there's the good lines of com communication between various businesses into the Treasury departments so that they've got a good oversight of data and new business that's going on within those, those organize within those different businesses um and that constant um check and control process so reviewing and checking and controlling the models uh reviewing interpretations on a regular basis uh use partners wherever possible to check your governance and, and controls i think when you're in a larger organization you do have uh uh, the advantage of having uh, bigger departments, more resource to, to call on. So you've got to be um, clever around um, getting different perspectives on, on your in interpretations and governance frameworks that, that, that you're implementing. Um, yeah, I think making no assumptions really around uh, what the regulations might might mean and whether they impact you is, is a, uh, another key key point and really um, checking um, and getting validation of decisions around up and coming regulation and, and the impact of new business on existing processes and, and controls. Thank you, Vanessa. And finally, can I turn to you, Beata? Yeah, I uh, agree both with Vanessa and uh, with Frank. Uh, so we are operating in a heavily regulated landscape. So uh, there is a need for the data because without the data, we cannot perform the proper regulatory review or reporting process. So first point on our agenda should be data, data set, and um, which is acting maybe this database as the one uh, point of uh, true single point of truth for for all bank and uh, it is uh, 
really strategic in my from my perspective. Um, also, we need to have the um, framework in the bank, which support our uh, reporting and reporting review process. Uh, this is another aspect which I would like to highlight and collaboration which Vanessa properly al already highlighted. Uh, there is a need to be cooperative between different departments, finance, treasury, risk, rather than working on the silo basis because and the introduction of new products, the new business uh, impact, obviously, the regulatory metrics. So if uh, one is not speaking to, uh, to another department, we cannot exchange potential impacts and um, the analysis is not performed from this perspective. Regarding the uh, frank uh, points for interest rate risk uh, impact in the, in the banking book, and this is the hot topic at the moment, given that Silicon Valley Bank, which Frank already mentioned uh, previously, um, yeah, it's uh, one of the uh, most important risk from treasury perspective, together with liquidity and funding. Uh, although I like to say that, uh, you know, mismanagement of uh, liquidity is like dying from heart attack. Meanwhile, mismanaging of interest rate risk is like dying from cancer. It's, but we saw that it was basically the hedging strategy, probably incorrect hedging strategy, which led um, Silicon Valley Bank to, to fail. Uh, there are many other aspects, of course, uh, but uh, as a treasurer, I would highlight the importance of the proper management of this risk and how treasury manages uh, the interest rate risk through application of the hedging strategy. And in a rising rate environment, we see really the importance of the effective hedging strategy because it is between surviving or not surviving or growing or having to withdraw from the lending market because we are not able to properly hedge it because we don't have access small banks to a sufficient amount of hedges because they're trading on the, on the bilateral basis or because uh, simply they don't hedge at all pipeline. For example, the pipeline uh, risk and uh, for us at a fixed rate and lack of this program embedded in the bank can uh, lead to the catastroph catastrophic consequences like we have seen already, for example, in UK market. Thank you, Beata. So there's a tension between the banking and the trading activities, and um, there's also an impact on the regulation in each area. Uh, so there are significant differences between banking book and trading book, uh, as we know. Uh, the activity of the first one involves customer funds and margin is made from lending and borrowing activity. There is a long-term strategy, long-term view and business objectives. Trading book is set up uh, with the objective of short-term profit, like we know, and requires acceptance of high amount of risk. Uh, now, regulation is clearly defining uh, what kind of transaction will fall under the trading book. And this is what was uh, quite, since quite a long time, we had this blurred boundary between banking book and trading book. So it was sometimes, you know, some kind of arbitrage could be seen between what is, um, what should be falling under trading book, what should be falling under banking book. Um, currently, this is this is being changed, and regulation uh, regulator acknowledged that the, the, it has to be changed because we need to have the clear boundary between banking book and trading book. So the basis of allocation now is supported by what is called the uh, presumptive list of instruments that go to the trading book and the list which go to the banking book, and obviously. The regulation is evolving, so we have the fundamental review of trading book for on the trading book side, which is quite complex and technical regulation. And we have this heavily regulatory landscape for the banking book, and it is evolving. So the like, regulatory landscape is evolving for, for those two. So, of course, there is a tension between banking book and trading book, because uh, also from the but they're different objectives, and uh, there is different regulation to cover 
uh, these books. So it is separate, a separate regulation and separate um, uh, objective of, of, the, of the book. Thank you, Beata. Can I turn to yeah. you, Frank, please? Can I just add? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Beata. Uh, great points. I just wanted to, to point out uh, an issue, in the, in, and Beata made a great point about the differences between trading and, um, and not trading. What has happened since the GFC is the regulators have created in the U.S., uh, um, the regulators have created for the bond portfolio uh, new categories. So it was either trading or not trading. Today they have, uh, they've created new categories. One is a health to maturity. Uh, one is an available for sale. Uh, and one is a trading category. So um, one of the, one of the, now we're all aware of it. Those that are banks that are, are have to actively manage that. But for those that are not, the difference is how you can treat them, how you treat them from an accounting perspective and a financial perspective. So just a, a brief background. A trading a book or trading a p l goes straight to your p l and it hits the p l hits your capital and your equity uh, available for sale uh, held to maturity uh, does not go to your equity at all so um, it's only net interest margin that will be impacted so for example you can have a hundred billion of um, unrealized losses you can have a billions of unrealized losses in a hundred billion portfolio as F SVB did, and it would, would not actually um, P&L. And then there's the, the hybrid, which is the available for sale, which gives the banks the option to hold uh, and or perhaps from time to time sell. That particular category is, goes into what's called other comprehensive income from a financial perspective. And that does impact your, your actual equity. So, uh, as Vanessa mentioned, there's more, uh, I'm sorry, Beata mentioned, they're trying to put more, uh, in one regard, they're trying to put st st stricter guidelines, but they're also, the new guidelines have allowed a lot of flexibility. Uh, so this AFS, for example, um, uh, that was the, one of the triggers that brought a Silicon Valley Bank down because they sold their AFS portfolio, which is, uh, which was, I want to say, they sold it for a loss of $2 billion which went straight to their capital. Now, I'll just take one other section. One other, I'll, I'll go into this, and we spoke on this the other day. And why did Silicon Valley Bank have such a $40 billion run? Well, the, the reason that Silicon Valley Bank had the run on their um, liquidity was because it finally it became, it, it became more apparent to the investors that Silicon Valley Bank's unrealized and realized losses were actually greater than their uh, regulatory capital. So they were basically upside down. And I think that is what's called tangible common equity. And I think that's what really set the set the run on Silicon Valley Bank. But to, to this specific question, the tension between the, the, the banking and the trading activities, you can see the regulatory um, arbitrage and Silicon Valley Bank tried to employ that regulatory, regulatory arbitrage, but unfortunately they didn't do it in the proper fashion. Um, I hope that's a little more helpful and I hope it wasn't confusing with the different types of bond classifications. Thank you, Frank. So what factors should banks consider when deciding on a reporting model and how can they balance the benefits of and costs of in-house reporting versus external vendors? If you could lead on that, Vanessa, please. I think um, I think it's not just a... a a cost question here and uh, i think there's you know certain um danger of being you know pound wise penny foolish in 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 this uh instance it's around um capability and i think um providing um mitigating the risk around the constant changing regulatory requirements so you know that there's one there's one constant in this world and that that is change and and that's certainly um applicable in in the regulatory world um important thing to remember is your obligations remain the same as i said earlier but the technical support and um change obligations would be vastly reduced were you to to utilize an external vendor um the you know there'd be there you need to look at your technical 
capabilities in house versus what you can um, get from from using a, an external ven vendor, um, and the complexity of interpreting the re regulations uh, into your various models and uh, reporting tools. Um, Bieta mentioned earlier around data, um, and that is a constant um, challenge for the organisation. You will still have to supply um, the data, etc. So outsourcing to a vendor will not um, will will not shield you from that requirement. Uh, you still have that um, obligation and, and requirement to manage your data and to to be very clear on your data dictionaries as well. So a big factor is the feeling of control, being in control of your reporting, as in I'm doing it myself and I know exactly what, what's doing it and I'm in, uh, the people I employ directly are, are performing the, the reporting versus ensuring that you've got good governance and oversight of your uh, reporting partner and your external vendor. Um, I think it's... It, it's, it's an interesting... Um, predicament to or, or challenge to, to to weigh up um weigh up the benefits i think a lot of the time in a smaller organization a lot can be said for going with the right partners um and taking advantage of expertise that you would not be able to have in house because of the size of your organization um and also your the technical debt and, and complexity with you know is also a big consideration um but never forget the obligations you've got to make sure it's being done right and to demonstrate that you are putting those controls and checks in place with your um, external vendor. Thank you, Vanessa. If you could continue on that point, Frank. Yeah, I think that that's a. I think that uh, Vanessa hit all the all the great points. The only thing I might add was I, I would I would recommend that um, if someone does have an external vendor. Uh, finally picks one at the same time they should run their own internal models as best as they can uh, to have a sort of a, you know you're the first we're the first line of defense um, and then the the external model would be the second line of defense and then I guess the auditors would be the third line of defense but again just to be mindful of I always find it uh, very um, beneficial for no matter what size of the bank we do it here uh, is is we still run our own internal models just to make sure uh, that that we are on the same page. Uh, and finally, because as, and as Vanessa hit it, but the really you know the, the primary responsibility always falls on on the bank on us. So um, usually where the primary responsibility falls, we're going to put the most conscientious uh, efforts in. Uh, but again, just for ourselves to make sure that you um, run your own internal models. Um, and then uh, make sure that they are, are as reasonably close to the externals as possible. Thank you, Frank. Uh, can you conclude on that, Beata? Yeah, so uh, there are great points both raised by Vanessa and Frank. Mm, I would uh, like to add one additional point. So definitely the external consultants, because we are talking about the external vendors or people which are outsourced for doing our regulatory reporting, they have knowledge and they have really, they can bring uh, a lot of um, added value to our, to our interpretation of the rules. And yeah, there is great knowledge behind. However, they don't know the bank's data. They don't know the bank's uh, product. They just learn what is our bank and what is our, what our, the, uh, our product characteristics, so which we, if the revolving clients are uh, committed or uncommitted or conditional, unconditionally committed. So we, we just, um, uh, we need to ensure that this uh, knowledge about the product, about the regulatory reporting is built at some point in-house, even if we are small, small institution. And this is extremely important because um, even it is big investment for the bank to get that knowledge and this, that expertise in-house, but really the benefit is great because these people uh, know the balance sheet, they know the product, they know where data, data is, and they know where to look for this. Thank you, Beata. Uh, 
So are there any alternatives available to smaller banks that aren't available to larger players? And how can smaller banks leverage these alternatives to their advantage? If you could start on that, please, Frank. Yeah, um, um, that's a tough one for me. Um, uh, so uh, the only advantage or um, uh, I could see is by on, from a cost basis where the regulations might not require as such sophisticated models, et cetera. It doesn't mean that so perhaps uh, as banks are planning their risk management uh, regime or models, et cetera, uh, they don't have to be as, under such a strict regulatory um, guidance. And so perhaps they can, and I have to be careful, I don't want to say have some cost savings, but uh, they can implement some, shall we say, find the, the proper systems that can meet the safety and soundness required, but not have to spend the kind of, you know, financial uh, investments that the bigger banks would do. Uh, again, it's, it's, it has to be um, straight safety and soundness and, and, and check all the boxes. But uh, I think that the regulators come in with a lot stricter guidelines. And so I think the only alternative for the or advantage to smaller banks is they might not have to, um, uh, expend so much uh, of their capital to hire the best or hire the the um, the most voluminous uh, system. I think that would be the uh, the final. I would think their their advantages is they can learn from the bigger banks uh, mm -hmm. without having to employ a lot of the models of the bigger banks. Um, I mean, by having meetings and conversations, I think a lot of the smaller banks would be. Uh, um, best served by just having conversations with the bigger banks, seeing what the bigger banks, attending conferences, listening to platforms like this, for example, where they can learn what some of the other, in a deeper dive, what some of the other bigger banks are doing and how they're managing it. Uh, and if they can replicate that, uh, then they're in, in, in good shape. Thank you, Frank. Could you continue on that, Beata, please? Yeah, smaller bank uh, could take opportunity of uh, of the changes in the regulatory space, even uh, though they are small, uh, because uh, already the building the infrastructure, data infrastructure, will bring enormous benefits for not only for the regulatory department but for for all other departments. Um, also, we know that regulatory uh, requirements for smaller bank are less onerous. Therefore, there are usually less resources which are involved in the regulatory reporting and review process. Um, and uh, as a consequence, uh, I would say that there is one small benefit, uh, which from my perspective is very important is the collaboration because uh, people where there is you know less heavy uh, infrastructure in terms of of people in terms of resources um, can speak to each other on the daily basis they can exchange view there is more contact daily contact there is more more regulatory um, socialization across the bank and um, you know the bigger banks instead they can leverage the um, existing processes uh, to uh, you know to the new product or new regulatory set and this is for for them a benefit definitely benefit because they have already some uh, infrastructure in place the data infrastructure i suppose strong data infrastructure so they can leverage this for to endorse to embrace the new regulatory challenge, new reg new product, which brings some regulatory uh, consequences. Thank you, Beata. And can you conclude on that point, Vanessa, please? I think um, Beata and Frank have <laughs> probably covered most of the uh, um, alternatives, some great points there. I, I, I think I've particularly picked up on the lead times that um, Frank mentioned around learning from um, l large organisations, you definitely get that advantage in a smaller organisation to 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 learn and to take advantage of um, what what is happening at larger organisations. Um, and you obviously have the advantage of being able to delegate some of your reporting in any case without having to implement big technical solutions. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably about it. I think Frank and Bianca covered most of it. Thank you.
Um, so what lessons can bank learn from the mistakes made by previous organizations when it comes to regulatory compliance and how can they ensure that regulation is part of their decisions and their plans? Uh, if you could start on that, please, Beata. So uh, regulation has to be a part of uh, all decision in plans because it's so important topic. And they are uh, not being compliance with regulatory reporting can be really expensive for the bank in, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of uh, regulatory uh, capital surcharge or, or whatever. There's penalty, there's even the license withdrawal potentially if you are not compliant. So definitely we need to be compliant. So. Uh, uh, this is the first point. Uh, I think that regulation, the importance of regulation is growing, uh, growing over time as the, the banking industry is evolving, as uh, treasury is evolving, ILM is evolving, uh, and complexity of uh, products is uh, increasing, then uh, regulatory reporting is obviously following the process. So it is more complex, it is more uh, it is more uh, sophisticated, the regulation itself. Um, we need to make sure every single product which we are going to uh, onboard on our balance sheet needs to be assessed, needs to be assessed from the regulatory perspective. What are the impacts on all metrics? For example, as a treasury, we can say LCR, NSFR, Capita, um, IRBB, obviously. So this is something which we are assessing all the time. So there has to be process in the bank, for example, for new products which are launched by the bank, when every single department, and especially a regulatory department, is uh, assessing the risks, assessing the regulatory um, uh, requirements in consideration to this or oh, to this particular product. Thank you, Beata. Uh, could you continue on that point, Vanessa? I was going to say probably exactly the same thing as Beata uh, has mentioned around the importance of ensuring you, your treasury department and your regulatory and risk department are core sign off really for any new product and, and process um, throughout the business. Yeah. And can you conclude uh, there, Frank? Sure. I think uh, Beata made a great point that uh, not being compliant is extremely cost costful. Uh, but I think I'd, I'd add um, that there's a bunch of lessons, a number of lessons that we've learned uh, from Silicon Valley Bank, et cetera. But uh, one of the one of my uh, one of the, the points I'd like to make is regulatory capital and regulations are sometimes overrated. Um, for example, regulatory capital um, sometimes is in a, can be a, like a life preserver in a tsunami, as we saw in the Silicon Valley Bank. I mean, it, it just wasn't enough. The regulatory capital wasn't enough. I think that uh, some of the lessons that we've learned is that despite the, regu despite the regulations, we need to pay attention to uh, risk management basics 101. It, it, I don't think the banks need to have the mindset that um, you have a framework that's provided by the regulators, but you need to to enhance that framework. It just shouldn't be what the regulators say. It, it those should be at a minimum, and we should strive to uh, enhance those regulations. The other thing that always occurs to me is about regulations, and I've been at bigger banks and smaller banks, and you know, regulations one size does not fit all. Uh, and so as a consequence, again, the point is we need to really look at the regulations and and find based on our business model and our strategy, uh, what are the most relevant points and perhaps how can we enhance them? Um, another couple of lessons is we learned from stress testing. I mean, stress testing at Silicon Valley Bank. Stress testing can be what the Fed or the regulators recommend, but, but perhaps it could even be greater than what the regulators recommend. Perhaps on, a, on an interest rate stress test, we don't take what, what the Fed is projecting, but we take an up and down two or 300 basis scenario. Uh, and finally, I, I think about, you know, some of the other consequences and the conversations that have occurred since Silicon Valley Bank. And in the U.S., one of the big topics of conversation was uninsured deposits versus insured deposits. And so there's been a a lot of conversation around the 
what banks have the most uninsured deposits versus insured deposits. I think what that is redirecting it is 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 redirecting a focus or a, a focus onto something that might not necessarily provide you the the true metrics of that bank for the safety and soundness. For example, Bank of New York has a high percentage of uninsured um, deposits. But why is that? Because th their business model is they are, are they are a bond settlement house and so there's a lot of a, a lot of um of, of of dda and custodial accounts that have a lot of money sitting there that necessarily are going to be uninsured so we need to be a lot of the lessons learned another lesson learned is you need to do your own due diligence you need to look at some of your bank counterparts you need to look past um just some of the financials and you have to look in a deep dive into for example um regulatory capital versus tangible common equity you have to look inside what is the bank's assets and, and, and how much is it hedged and how much is it properly hedged as both Vanessa and Beata pointed out so uh, a lot of lessons a lot of lessons learned and I think hopefully this is a wake-up call uh, for the the not only the smaller banks but the big banks to understand your risks and manage them properly thank you Frank and if you could take the next question again actually so it kind of leads on from the last one. How can smaller banks create a culture that enables them to sufficiently anticipate regulatory changes to mitigate risk? Um, well, you know, I, I think that uh, Vanessa said it early about uh, a culture. Uh, and uh, that is just, you know, having your people. And I think that Beata mentioned earlier about how the smaller banks have the ability um, to work closer together because they're smaller. So I, I think if you were to combine the two, you know, the idea of a culture and the fact that, you know, in a, in a JP Morgan, they might have 200 people in a liquidity department uh, and uh, 200 people in interest rate risk department. And they all they all answer up to one person. Um, and then eventually those those people might might discuss. But when you're a smaller institution, it's a lot easier to formulate smaller committees and at those committees. You can identify some of the risks and you can create that culture, which I think would be most beneficial. So I think that uh, combining a little bit of an S and Beata's comments from earlier to say the smaller banks uh, have that uh, better ability to uh, to build that closer little network and develop that culture. Thank you, Frank. Can I put that to you, uh, Beata? Yeah, of course. So um, I think that um, Frank already covered uh, important points, but one which I would like to add, what we can do in order to anticipate the regulatory changes and to mitigate risk, because also we want to make sure that we are always up to date and we are even one step ahead of the regulatory changes in order to plan. So uh, first of all, in UK, we have this UK Finance um, Forum, where which represent the the collective view for for banking and finance industry, and we also receive on the monthly basis uh, the PRA uh, monthly uh, new letters, which is called Regulatory Digest, and from there we have um, we can understand what's coming coming up, and we can already plan. Thank you, Beata. And can you conclude on that question, Vanessa? Yeah, I probably can't add much more to the points that Beata and Frank have made. Um, I, I think, you know, promoting and prioritising collaboration with peers like the Small Bankers Association or UK Finance, um, like Beata mentioned, um, and uh, other external organisations, you know, is, is key. Um ensuring uh, the upstream and downstream implications are known uh, throughout the team because um, we are a small we are smaller teams and so do have that advantage as Frank Frank said to, to collaborate and get together to to understand impacts uh, but I think just change is constant um, and as small banks we need to equip ourselves appropriately um, we can't be diverted by regulatory change it's got to be a core part of our operation. Thank you, Vanessa. So as the shadow banking sector grows and takes more market share, is the lack of regulatory oversight in the shadow banking sector creating an unfair playing field? And I'll put this to you, Beata. Uh, 
Yeah, so let's start with uh, the definition of shadow banking first, because before uh, before our webinar, actually some people even didn't know what shadow banking is. So let me introduce the topic first. So uh, shadow banking describes financial intermediaries that participate in creating credit, but are not subject to the regulatory oversight. They are often known as non-bank financial companies. And example includes hedge funds, private equity funds, uh, mortgage lender. Um, the one characteristics, so as I said, they are creating credit but there is big difference between shadow banking and um, the, regular, the, um, uh, the traditional banking because they are not subject to the same kind of regulatory, uh, regulatory set. Um, so they have a reporting set. Uh, so they are not subject to, uh, uh, to the risk like liquidity, capital restrictions, uh, interest rate risk in the banking book. And um, this is instead quite uh, important topic for the traditional banks to stay compliant with the regulation. So um, as such, I would say, given that there is the same activity level between those two, so they are creating credit, as I said, but um, they are not subject to the same uh, level of regulation, there is possibility to create additional risk to the system and to the entire global financial system. And we know that shadow banking played a major role uh, in the expansion of housing credit in 2008 financial crisis. Thank you, Beata. So banks have traditionally faced the economy between regulatory and economic capital. So as regulatory measures have become more risk sensitive, is this distinction blurring? And are regulatory capital measures being used in capital allocation decisions? Can I put this one to you, Frank, please? So this is a very interesting question. Um, um, as, as the regulatory measures become more risk sensitive, I, I think that's that's a, uh, perhaps, as, as, I, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, some, sometimes I think regulatory capital is overrated. Um, so I, I would say that uh, if you blur the lines and, and bring the two of them closer together, um, I think it's probably a, a, a better um, a better for the banking for banking in general. I mean, we do have to use um, you know the economic measure of economic capital, uh, and it, I would think that the bank safety and soundness would be better off, so better served by having that. You know, the more blur. Or I would say the closer that they are together would be best for the, the banks and the banking community. So um, I don't think this is a, a bad thing. I think it's uh, finally, I think it's probably a very um, prudent um, thing. And I think most banks should. I, I hate to say it sometimes, as I mentioned, sometimes, you know, the um, uh, regulatory capital as a, as a buffer can be um, overrated. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Frank. And the final question I'm going to put to you again, Beata. So is there cost regulatory capital being properly embedded into banking products today? Not always. Uh, and indeed, this is very important that there are cost of regulatory compliance and um, additional, obviously, costs is reflected in pricing, in pricing of the product and in FTP because the FTP is the basis of pricing, as we know. So, uh, for example, I will give a practical example. Uh, first of all, uh, LCR is a big regulatory uh, requirements for banks in terms of the liquidity requirements and a counterbalancing capacity for banks and having this additional buffer of li liquid asset in order to uh, meet unexpected liquidity outflow. Uh, however, this is known in FTP as the indirect liquidity cost, as opposed to the term liquidity premium, which is something else, which is the cost of the consumptions of the liquidity for, for, for the term, for example, for five years or four years or whatever. And indirect liquidity cost, uh, now it's not the case, but usually over the last 10 years, was a cost 
for for uh, for ILM department for Treasury to maintain this HQLA because funding of HQLA was more expensive than actual yield on the HQLA. Now with rates moving up and uh, at a high level, we know that it's not anymore the case. We can fund the HQLA cheaper than uh, the yield, which is on HQLA, uh, gain on HQLA. Uh, however, as I said, for 10 years, it was not the case. So therefore the cost of non uh, this liquid asset buffer and indirect liquidity cost uh, has to be reflected in the product pricing because otherwise it is unfair ilm stays with the you know cost of maintenance of liquid asset buffer which is driven by the requirements of the certain products and certain divisions. Like, for example, we know that uh, CASA, current account savings accounts, uh, there is the requirements, regulatory requirements to hold certain percentage. And if they are uh, deposit from deposit aggregators, for example, then you have to hold even more, up to 40% for LCR. So imagine this be being done uh, over the last 10 years, how 40% you would need hold of outstanding of the balances in terms of uh, the lab. So it's it's very high. So the cost of funding um, of uh, this product would be much higher than if you don't include the indirect liquidity costs in, in pri into pricing. So many banks still don't have the um, indirect costs embedded in pricing, which is exactly the cost of being compliant with Basel III. Thank you, Beata. And thanks to uh, Vanessa, Beata, and Frank for what's been really been a fascinating discussion. And I'm going to turn back over to Nicolina uh, now. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Sean. And thank you, dear panelists, for such an interesting discussion. Thank you once again for sharing your time with us today. To your audience who's watching us right now, I hope you all enjoyed it. And for any questions that we didn't manage to address during this hour, we'll make sure to follow up with you in a separate email. And with that, I would also like to remind you that we will be circulating a copy of today's discussion in the next couple of hours. So please look out for that email. Lastly, we would love your feedback. So if you could take a moment to answer our very brief survey that's on your main screen, that would be very much appreciated. On behalf of Finastra and Connect Global Group, thank you all for tuning in and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you and have a lovely day, Feather.